Humankind has always needed and liked models, and the scientific community is no exception. And indeed, as I hope I'll show this evening, model building is one of the oldest and most vital of scientific activities. Now, modern computer technology has given us an absolutely fantastic possibilities to build realistic models of complex systems. And computer modeling now pervades the whole of science and engineering. And what I hope to do is to give you just a glimpse of the way in which this technology is being used and its impact in, on science and engineering. But I also hope to show that what we're doing now with computers is just the modern way of doing what scientists have done since the beginning of scientific thought. So let's look at some models. Here is the Ptolemaic model of the universe. It is a highly complex, it's a three-dimensional model, uh, it's a highly complex model with intersecting trajectories and spheres, and it rationalised some of the astronomical observations in the ancient world. It's an Earth-centred model, I think, as you'll see on the slide. Uh, one has, though, some sympathy with the King of Aragon, I think it was in the 12th century, who said when he saw this model, uh, if I had been the Almighty, I think I would have tried to make something simpler. <laughs> and, in fact, the King was right, because the Ptolemaic model was swept away uh, by the heliocentric uh, Copernican model in the 16th century, uh, which, a much simpler model, and which rationalised a wider range of astronomical data. But it was a model, and it was a useful model. Let me now just look at some models which uh, are in the Royal Society's uh, collection. You'll see there a model of the transit of Venus. That was a very important astronomical observation made in the 18th century. And then a very early model helping to understand uh, terrestrial magnetism. And here are some other models. These are beautiful models uh, used as, actually mainly as teaching aids, uh, models of marine creatures, again, I think from the, uh, from the last century. So modelling, I say, is all pervasive. And let's now move to modelling models of molecules and, uh, and crystals. Now, what we have here is probably the first ever molecular model. This very same model uh, was shown here in the Royal Institution in a discourse given by Hoffman in April 1865. The discourse was on the combining power of atoms, what we would now call valence. It's a remarkable model. It's a model of methane, carbon in the centre, black, four hydrogen atoms. And in fact, Hoffman had got the valence, the combining power of carbon, right. It does indeed bond to four hydrogen atoms in the methane molecule, he got the stereochemistry of the shape wrong. In fact, it's tetrahedral, but he didn't have the means then of knowing that. But that is a real landmark in the development of chemistry. Let me show you another model that's a landmark. This is a model of lysozyme, an enzyme. Uh, <clears throat> the structure of this enzyme at the molecular level was determined here in the Royal Institution by David Chilton Phillips and his then student Louise Johnson, who became one of very distinguished molecular biologists. It is a landmark in the development of molecular biology. And I should say that David Phillips and Louise Johnson were very much helped and encouraged by Lawrence Bragg, the then director, and I'll come back to some of the other many achievements of Bragg, of Bragg uh, later on. But say, so, these are molecular models. And on the screen, you'll see more molecular models. You'll see Lord Kelvin uh, with models of close pack structures there. Again, we'll come back to those later. And you'll see Harry Croto, the Nobel Prize winner in chemistry, uh, with models of carbon. Croto won the Nobel Prize uh, for demonstrating that carbon could form these beautiful open structures, including the famous buckyballs. And I should mention that both Kelvin and Harry Croto lectured regularly at the RI and, in fact, were very good friends of the institution. So perhaps we've got a feeling now for the importance of models in science and the, uh, and the long-standing history. Why do we need 
models in science? Why do we need models in general? And we need them because models scale objects and processes to a size that we can understand and be familiar with. They scale <coughs> length and time scales that we cannot imagine. Tiny, unimaginable fractions of a second, uh, which is time scales over which some processes take place, or immensely long time scales, which again we'll see in a few minutes. It's, it, some processes in cosmology take place over billions of years, but these models allow us to scale them, and they allow us to scale enormous objects like the universe and tiny objects like atoms, nuclei, and subatomic particles to a size that we can understand and be familiar with. So that's why we really need models. And let's just think about computer modeling. Computer modeling bridges fundamental theory with experiment. Because of the triumphs, the many triumphs of science, we understand many of the fundamentals in the universe. We understand what can, well, I'm not saying we understand, but we can predict and calculate how electrons behave in atoms and molecules. We do that using quantum mechanics. Now, uh, Richard Feynman famously said, nobody understands quantum mechanics, and I think he's right, but it nevertheless provides us a machinery to predict how electrons behave in atoms and molecules. And if we look at planets and stars, we can use um, <coughs> gravity and relativity. If we're talking about engineering aspects, fluid flow, we have the Navier-Stokes equations. So we have this fundamental knowledge, and we can now deploy this using computers to predict complex reality. So let's start looking at some complex reality. Um, I say computer modeling bridges theory and experiment, as we're showing here. And I'm giving you an example of a very bit of complex reality there uh, with the mesoporous silica system that I'm going to come back to uh, later on. But let me now start with modeling the biggest things. Modeling, in fact, the universe. And I'm going to show you now uh, some wonderful modeling results. I'll show them in <coughs> visual form obtained by Carlos Frank. Uh, a world-leading cosmologist at the University of Durham who has used throughout his career computer modelling to try and understand uh, the evolution of the universe. So what we'll see here is how in initially a <coughs> low-density cloud, this is early on in the universe, starts to condense. I just absolutely love this video. It starts to condense. You can now see, by the way, hundreds of millions of years are passing here. Uh, you can now see structure beginning to emerge. And we're now at the beginning of star formation. And you can see gravity beginning to pull uh, uh, these elements together. Um, absolutely wonderful. So it's pulling more material in. We're forming more stars, those are the red bits, uh, and we see real structure beginning to emerge, and we've then got kind of embryonic galaxy forming, but more is going to happen. Uh, this is now going to start to mop up more material around it. Sometimes it'll throw the material away. Um, <clears throat> and again, we now see a, a really well-formed galactic structure emerging. And this is all, okay, I think, since I started this video, probably about two or three billion years has passed. Uh, and now we have this beautiful galaxy. And this was obtained by computational modeling by Carlos's uh, group, who've done such wonderful work in this field. And we now get, we kind of move away, and we get a feeling for this part of the universe, and we can see several of the galaxies that have condensed over this period. So that's modeling the biggest things. Things of the scale of the universe, modeling processes that have taken place over billions of years. Now let's move to the global scale. And we're now going to talk about modeling 
the Earth. In particular, I'm going to talk about modelling the Earth's oceans. I should express my gratitude here to the UK Oceanographic Centre for uh, helping me with this. Now, here we have the Earth, and just to say uh, that the ocean is understanding the oceans are hugely important. As it says here, massive store of heat and carbon, biodiversity. We need to understand the oceans. We need to understand <coughs> how the oceans evolve, how they're going to be influenced by climate change and in particular we need to understand the currents in the ocean. Now this is a model of ocean circulation. We're looking at the North Atlantic. You'll see at the kind of top there a stream is beginning to emerge from the Gulf. It's traveling across the North Atlantic and shortly it will reach Northwest Europe and it's a good thing it, meets North it reaches Northwest Europe because it helps us to keep us warm, particularly in the winter. Now we'll move on, we'll look at some of the currents taking place in the Pacific and I said these models, they all fit in, I should say that the same with Carlos's models, they all fit in with experiment but they end help us understand uh, the experimental observation. And this kind of information, crucial in understanding how the oceans evolve and how the oceans interact uh, with the atmosphere. Extreme weather forecasting, absolutely vital. Computer modelling plays a key role here. Uh, this is an example of a prediction that was made of a hurricane some years ago. Uh, and if we can predict when these extreme weather events take place, uh, then <coughs> mitigating action uh, can be uh, mitigating action can be taken. So again, computer modelling playing a key role here. And I should say that many, many, the predictions we make about climate change are based on detailed computer models. Let me just, before I leave this, I'd like to show you another video which I really like. Uh, this is one about how the ice evolves and the sea temperature evolves uh, in what's called the Greenland Scotland uh, Ridge. And again, it's a beautiful video. We're starting, I think, at the, it's in time, uh, at kind of late autumn. And let's see what happens. But what you'll see there, can you see that white bit? That is now the ice sheet beginning to grow. You see the red bit retreating as the ocean cools. And again, this, I should say, really helps us understand what is going on in this very complex system. Now, I think we're getting to spring now. The ice sheet retreats, and you'll see uh, the red bit, which is the hot, the warmer ocean, beginning to expand. And I think we've got to the end of a, another season now, and the ice sheet uh, begins to grow. But again, these models are absolutely vital in helping us to understand um, <laughs> understand the, the evolution of the ice sheet, evolution of ocean temperatures, and again, how they are affected by climate change. Let's now move down a scale, and we'll start talking about modelling at our scale. And I think here of modelling relating to planes, medical applications, hearts, bubbles, and bones. And I should express here my gratitude uh, to the UK supercomputer facility in Edinburgh, uh, the Archer facility. Now let me show you this video first. This is video of what is happening uh, around what's called a cavitation bubbles. These can occur in engineering applications. They can occur actually in our blood. And it's really important to know what happens uh, when they <coughs> meet a shock wave. And this video will show you that in exquisite detail. You see the wave propagating outwards, you see all the ripples and eddies, and this kind of information, again, is valuable in both engineering and in some case in, in kind of health applications. So very detailed modelling there, and I should say this was carried out uh, by uh, Dr Tsutsunanis at the Centre for Computational Engineering Sciences in Cranfield University. Here's a modelling of turbulence, understanding turbulence, absolutely crucial in aircraft design. And um, here we're seeing turbulence in uh, a supersonic mixing, so this is kind of important for uh, <coughs> the development of supersonic uh, uh, aviation and really the thing to take away from this is the immense complexity as these flows meet each other cause this turbulent flow cause all kinds of eddies and as you see here shocklets are generated due to the turbulence compressibility but really the thing to take away from this is the immense detail at which this modeling has given us 
So, just a final example, and one again relating to uh, biomedicine. This is uh, just a snapshot. I'm not going to show you a video here. This is what the inside of our blood vessels look like. You have these uh, little protuberances here. They play an important role in controlling uh, the transport of material in the blood and understanding how they behave, understanding their dynamics is really important. This is just a snapshot of a dynamic simulation. And finally, from the medical applications, well, not finally, nearly finally, we look at simulation of heart, of a heart. Now, again, this is a very, very important and widely used technology to understand uh, the dynamics of heart, of essentially the heart pumping, uh, and to understand perhaps how that dynamics can be perturbed when damage is done to the heart. So we'll just see, uh, this is again a video of uh, a simulation, and I say the simulations give us information about what factors can affect uh, this <laughs> process on which our lives all depend. And then finally, let me show you this. This is... Uh, Simulations applied to bone structure. Again, engineering applications, understanding the stability, the strength of bone, understanding how it's modified by disease. Uh, this, again, this work carried out at the Archer supercomputer, very, very important in helping to develop treatments uh, for bone abnormalities. Well, those are just a glimpse of applications in the field of engineering and in the field of health. What I want to move on to now, for probably most of the rest of the discourse, is modelling molecules and materials, because this is what I do, it's what I know uh, most about. And what we want to do is to learn about the structures at the atomic and molecular level of molecules and crystals. Uh, we want to understand their dynamics, we want to understand their reactivity. Now again, we have the fundamental knowledge to allow us to do that. Over the last ooh, 60 years or so, we've built up huge databases of how atoms interact with each other. And we can use those, we can feed them into the computer. We have quantum mechanics, which tells us, allows us to calculate how electrons behave within atoms. Now, I say, we can use that fundamental knowledge, we can feed it into the computer, and it can produce us detailed and increasingly accurate models of structure, dynamics, and reactivity of matter at the atomic level. Let me just give you one initial example, and this <coughs> relates to, of course, to the uh, crisis that we've been through in the last two years, uh, the, the COVID pandemic. And I'd just like to actually take a step back and say that the global scientific community and those who, so like you who support the scientific community should feel very proud of what the scientific community achieved during the COVID pandemic. Almost all components of that community responded, I think, superbly to the challenge. And the fact that we've emerged, uh, we hope, from the pandemic owes a lot to the commitment of scientists. And this is one example. This is an example of understanding at the molecular level how one of the key proteases that's vital in the reproduction of the uh, virus uh, can be inhibited uh, by inhibitor drugs. Uh, and let's just have a look at the video. Uh, the first thing to notice is that it's a dynamic entity. I'm going to come back to that later. Uh, you know, actually, molecules aren't static assemblies uh, like this lovely model of lysozyme. The dynamic entities, here you'll see the inhibitor model in the active site of the enzyme. We can really get detailed information of how it behaves, and we can also predict if we model, modify that molecule, uh, will it improve the e efficacy of the inhibitor. And this was carried out by scientists at King's College in collaboration uh, with scientists at um, University of Southampton. But now let's move on to uh, modelling of materials at the atomic level, because this is my speciality. And we can do a great deal, as I hope to show you in a few minutes, we can model structures of really complex molecules and materials at the atomic and molecular level. 
We can model their surfaces. Of course, a lot of what happens, the importance of a material is what's happening on its surface. And we can, we can do a terrific job there now. We can model defects. I'm going to show you later that although we look at these lovely models of crystals uh, with a nice regular arrangements, real crystals always contain defects, uh, missing atoms, additional atoms, and those defects can play a very, very important role in controlling the properties of the crystal. Uh, we can <coughs> uh, model how molecules enter and diffuse into porous materials. We can understand, in fact, the processes taking place during the synthesis of molecules and materials. Uh, nanochemistry, that I'm going to come back to later, uh, absolutely vital to... Modelling has played an absolutely vital role there, and I'll give you examples later. And then reactivity and catalysis. Again, I'll show you how we can understand chemical reactions in detail using the contemporary power of modelling. But let's now think a bit about crystals. Now, let me introduce you to this model. This is a model of sodium chloride. It is the original model of sodium chloride that was developed by these two great geniuses, William and Lawrence Bragg, uh, when they developed the science of crystallography using X-ray diffraction. And sodium chloride was one of the first structures that they solved. It's a beautiful, regular, cubic arrangement of atoms. Uh, the white ones, let's say, are sodium, and the red ones are chlorine. So this is, I say, the first model of this, of this widely, this important and widely studied uh, crystal. And I say it was determined by William and Lawrence Bragg, both of whom subsequently became directors of the Royal Institution. But I'm asking a question here. Why do atoms, when you try and pack them together in three dimensions, why do they order? Why do they form these lovely regular arrays? And the reason why they do is simply because that is the most efficient way of assembling them in three dimensions. And I think we're now we're going to try and uh, illustrate this with a very simple model here. Now, we've got these uh, black balls that Thomas is showing you. Imagine those are atoms, and we've got a little bit of a template for them to nucleate on, and we'll start uh, dropping them onto this surface, and let's see what they do. Apart from dropping on the floor, let's see what they do. <laughs> What you see, they start to slot into place and they start to form more kind of nice regular layers. Now, they're doing that not because Thomas and Mike have told them to do that. They're doing that because actually this is the most efficient way for them to assemble. So there we have, well done. There we have a, in fact, a close packed structure. So that's a dense structure. Really, we're just packing the atoms together as tightly as we can. We'll see in a few minutes other structures which are much more open, but nevertheless, still the ordered way of arranging the atoms is the most energy efficient. So we understand in general terms why uh, we form these regular three dimensional systems. But can we predict them? Now, here we have actually quite a famous piece of science journalism. This was a News and Views article in Nature uh, in 1988. Uh, it was made by John Maddox, who was a very celebrated editor of Nature. Um, and he said, one of the continuing scandals in physical sciences is that it remains impossible to predict the structures of even the simplest crystalline solids from a knowledge of their composition. Now, when I read that in 1988, I was pretty annoyed uh, because I didn't think it was true <laughs> that we were making progress in being able to predict crystal structures. So um, I got in touch with Maddox and said, well, I don't think you quite got this right. And he very kindly said, OK, well, you write me an article in Nature to show what you can do in predicting crystal structures. So together with my colleague at UCL, David Price, we wrote this article, uh, which was published in 1990. So Maddox had come up with a, a pretty inaccurate piece of science. It was a fantastic piece of journalism. 
absolute, because you say it stimulated me uh, and David Price to respond with a detailed article in Nature, uh, and it actually stimulated the whole field. Lots of people said, we're going to show that Maddox is wrong. Um, <laughs> and there's another article there, uh, which my colleague Scott Woodley and I produced at the 20th anniversary of the Maddox Challenge. So I say, rather dodgy science, but absolutely great journalism. And it did a good job. It stimulated the field. Now, I want to talk, give you illustrations of structure prediction by introducing you to a class of crystalline solids that I've been fascinated uh, with since early in my career, and in which a great deal of work was done here in the Royal Institution in the 1990s. Um, these are zeolites. The zeolites are aluminosilicate. So what that means is they're built up out of uh, simple building blocks, silicon surrounded by four oxygens at the corners of a tetrahedron, and aluminium surrounded by four oxygens, again, at the corners of a tetrahedron. And what do we do? Well, we start to fit those together, and we fit them together just by these tetrahedra sharing corners. And in fact, almost the whole of the hugely diverse silicate and aluminosilicate chemistry is based on that principle. So we fit them together by uh, sharing corners, but then we build up these beautiful networks that contain cages, pores, and voids. And they're some of the loveliest structures in the whole of uh, uh, solid-state structural science. Um, but why are we interested in them? We're interested in them just because they are such fascinating structures. They're also immensely important in industry. They're important for three reasons. The first, you see, they have these channels in them. Now, these channels are of molecular dimensions. So they're about the same size as a lot, particularly of lots of kind of petro molecules in petrochemicals. And we can use them for separation. And it's a little known fact that something like 30% of the chemicals industry is about separations. These are wonderful separations. They're just sieves. They can separate molecules of different sizes and shapes. So they're using separation technologies. Even more important is their use in catalysis. Uh, they, for instance, they will break down the long chain molecules that are in the tar fraction of oil, they break them down into the short chain molecules uh, that are in gasoline, petrol. Uh, and it's a commonly quoted but true statement that every drop of petrol in a car uh, has seen the inside of a zeolite. So they're used in, in very extensively in the petrochemicals industry, but they're used in fine chemicals as well. And the reason why they're so important is that in catalysis is they contain sites within them, acid sites and metals that can promote chemical reactions, but then the nature of the chemical reaction is controlled by the shape of these pores. It's known as shape-selective catalysis. There's a third application that's very important as well. It's the oldest and probably simplest application, and that's ion exchange. Uh, many of these zeolites, when you make them, they contain metal ions uh, in their cavities, and you can exchange them for other metal ions. And they're used, for example, in water softening. If you have a water softener in your house, you look at what its contents are, it will say aluminosilicates, and those are zeolites. They use as softeners in detergency as well. So really important industrial materials, but absolutely fascinating uh, for structural scientists. Now, can we predict their structures. Well, I'm going to give you one example here. Uh, this was work of uh, my colleague Scott Woodley, in fact, who was a postdoc here at the RI for several years. He's now, as you see, a professor of computational chemistry and physics at UCL. And he really founded the use of a, uh, an approach known as genetic algorithms for predicting the structures of crystals. It's uh, it's a lovely idea, actually. It's kind of based on evolutionary theory. So what you do if you want to predict the structure of a crystal, you start off just by generating lots of different structures, lots of different perhaps plausible structures, and then you allow them to breed. You allow them to exchange 
uh, features between themselves. But you only allow the ones to breed which have the best features. You have some simple, we call it a cost function, you have a simple way of assessing whether the structure is likely to be a good structure. You allow the good structures to breed and exchange information. And as you run through this simulation, the structures get better and better. And at the end, you do a more sophisticated calculation uh, to predict the final configuration of the structure. So it's a, it's a neat idea, and it's, it's based on kind of evolutionary theory. Well, Scott very much pioneered this when he was at the RI uh, for predicting the structure of crystals. I'm just going to give you one example. It's an early example. It's uh, one of these zeolites. This is the early stages of the simulation. It's kind of feeling its way. It's trying to find different ways of arranging. It's now found a really good way of arranging them, and it drives it downhill in energy. We'll have a look at it again. Again, I like this one so much. So I say this is early on in the simulation. It's trying to find what's the best way of arranging these. It's slowly getting better as it passes through subsequent generations. And he ends up with this structure, which is in fact a very accurate model of the structure of the minerals, soda, mineral and um, synthetic material, uh, sodalite. So that's an example of structure prediction. And over more recent years, uh, <coughs> these techniques have been used to predict structures that we simply didn't know and then have been verified experimentally. Let me show you some other examples. The other technique, again, which I think is easy to understand, is called simulated annealing. And what you do here is, using the computer, you take a model and you heat it up. You heat it up till it melts, and then you cool it down. And it will cool down into a number of different configurations, and then you try and find the lowest energy configuration, and that's your prediction for your structure. And beautiful work was done here by Caroline Mello, who you'll see there, who was, again, a very good friend of the RI and visited uh, and worked here uh, 15 years or so ago, and uh, she applied this technique to this class of material that are known as metal organic frameworks. And what you do is you have, I don't want to burden you with too much chemistry, on the left hand side you have, can you see that octahedron, that's got a metal atom in the centre and it's surrounded by six oxygens. Then the, next to it you see an organic molecule. And what you can do, you can start to fit these together, a uh, very lovely area of structural chemistry, and you can make lots and lots lots of fascinating porous structure. Well, Caroline uh, applied these methods uh, and successfully predicted structures, which we then, were, then she was able to show, um, rationalized experimental data. Here are more of the structures that she predicted, really beautiful examples of structural chemistry, complex structures. And here, perhaps, is the most complex, beautiful, open structures. really illustrates the beautiful beauty of uh, her solid state structural chemistry. Um, this work, which she did with her colleague Gérard Ferré, uh, was published some years ago. But again, this was using these computational simulated annealing techniques, which helped to solve the structures and rationalise the experimental data. Now, let's go back to our friends, the Braggs. What you're seeing here is a rather older version of Lawrence Bragg when he was director here at the Royal Institution. And what we're going to do, well, I'm not going to don't do any of the hard work around around here, uh, what Mike is going to do is show you one of Bragg's very famous um, uh, demonstrations, which helps us understand what happens when atoms pack together in crystals. Imagine each of those bubbles is an atom, and you see that they are, they do form quite nice regular arrays, but then you see that there are defects in those arrays, can you see some of them? I said earlier on, didn't I, that although crystals are regular arrangements of atoms in three dimensions, nevertheless, we do get defects in them. We get missing atoms, and I think we may be able to see kind of lines of defects as well when different parts of the... Uh, uh, different parts of this case, the, the, the soap bubbles on the raft uh, are interacting with each other. But we certainly see that although there are lots of ordered ar arrangements of atoms there, or we can now see a really nice line emerging there when two different regions are interacting. And this actually is a pretty good model for what happens in real 
crystals. Um, and in fact, what we're doing now is developing what we would call a void in the crystal. Um, you do get voids formed in crystals, particularly if you irradiate them. Um, but that's a lovely demonstration, and it's bringing home, yes, that, that, that these are representation of atoms. They do indeed form regular arrangements, but there are defects, missing atoms, and then line defects. Uh, in this arrangement. Now, Mike's done a fantastic job. Let's see how well Lawrence Bragg himself could do. So let's kind of bring Lawrence into the theatre. You'll hear his voice in a minute, and he will try and rival Mike uh, with the uh, bubble raft. OK, shall we make a start? So there you see... The, the bubbles bubble. produced form a kind of crystalline raft, which is quite regular because the bubbles are so uniform in size. Here is a later stage in the formation of such a raft. The pattern has rows in three directions. It's just like the model made of spheres. When the raft of bubbles forms, it's generally in portions of pattern which are not parallel, or as we should say, are distinct crystals. These meet at crystal boundaries. It can be seen in this raft that the rows are in different directions in neighboring crystals. This pattern of crystals in this larger raft is very similar to the pattern of crystals seen in an etched metal. Thank you. Well, I think we can give Lawrence uh, Bragg pretty good marks there. He did nearly as well as Mike. Um, but it also shows that as well as a scientific genius, what a fantastic expositor of science Lawrence Bragg was. Anyway, that was done here in the RI, I think in the 1950s. Um, well, what Bragg was showing there, that we get defects and what we would call microstructure. So I want now to move to how we can understand this using contemporary computer modelling. And I'll highlight some work here done by Regina Mapanga uh, and Puti Nwepe, who at the University of Limpopo in the South Africa, uh, with whom I have had a collaboration now for well over the best part of 30 years. They run a very effective materials modelling group up in the northeast of South Africa. So Regina visited us for a period, uh, probably about 15 years ago, and started this work in collaboration with Dean and Thie Sale, who again both worked in the 1990s at the RI. Now, this work concerned a very interesting material, that's manganese dioxide. It's important, actually, among, for a number of reasons. It's uh, potentially used in, well, it is in fact used in batteries. I'll come to batteries later on. Again, for the structural scientists, it's a really fascinating material. Again, it's based on octahedra. Manganese sits in the middle, surrounded by six oxygens, but you can fit them together in lots of different ways, and you're seeing two different ways here. But we wanted to generate a realistic model of this, just in the way that Mike and Lawrence Bragg did, a realistic model for this structure, because it won't be perfect. And we used, in fact, a method developed by Dean Sale. Uh, um, what he did was first, can you see on the top left-hand side there, you have a model for the crystalline material. And what you do computationally is you heat it up and it melts. And at the bottom on the left-hand side, you have a snapshot of the molten structure, which has got a disordered arrangement of atoms, and of course, the atoms are moving around. Then you take, and go to the right-hand side now, you take that molten structure and you start to cool it down and you apply a little bit of pressure. And it starts to crystallise. And then when you get to the low temperature, it will have crystallised, uh, but then you look at the model the crystalline model. And what do you find? You find first that it's got these features here. These are defects. We call these what we call vacancies. They're just missing atoms. That when, when it cooled down under pressure, there wasn't time for it to arrange as well as it could have done. So some atoms are missing from the place where they should be. And that's what happens in real crystals. And let's look at the next one. This is what we call a grain boundary. You remember in uh, 
Lawrence Bragg's video there, you saw, you saw those kind of bit disordered regions between two regular crystalline regions. We call those grain boundaries, simulated by the bubble raft, but here we get an accurate model simulated by computers. And these, again, these can control a lot of the properties of the materials. And you can see here this lovely grain boundary structure that's predicted by these models. So using the same kind of concepts uh, that Mike demonstrated and that Lawrence Bragg demonstrated, we are using the computer able to generate these realistic models of the microstructure of this material. Now, before I move on, let me show you this. This is a model of a glassy material. As I've talked a lot about crystals. Crystals are ordered arrangements of atoms in three dimensions. We just learned that they do get elements of disorder within them. Now, glasses are disordered arrangements of atoms in three dimensions. And this is a model for glassy uh, silica, silicon dioxide. It was developed by one of my colleagues, Ben Arm Vessel, probably about 30 years ago. You see, it's still got tetrahedra. So it's still based on silicon, surrounded by four oxygens, linking together, as we showed with the zeolites. But you don't get a regular uh, ordered pattern. There's still structure there, but it's a disordered uh, pattern. That actually turns out to be a pretty good model, we think now, for uh, amorphous silica. How is it, ge how is it uh, generated? Well, it was generated by a computational version of the real way in which you make glasses. You make a glass by starting from a crystalline material. This is ancient technology. You heat it up till it melts, and then you quench it quickly, and it doesn't have time for the atoms to organize themselves into the regular crystalline arrangement. And that's what you do on the computer. You take your model for crystalline silica, you heat it up, it melts, and then you cool down computationally uh, your model, and it forms this actual, turns out to be a pretty good model uh, for glassy silica. It's not order, but I still think it's really quite a beautiful model. Now, let's move on to another really important area of contemporary uh, science, and that is nanoscience. And again, I want to give you illustrations one from a few years ago uh, from this guy here, uh, Said Hamad, who was a PhD student here. Uh, about 15, 20 years ago. He's now a professor of chemistry back in Sevilla. Um, and he worked on developing models for nanostructured zinc sulfide. Now, again, I don't want to burn you with too much chemistry. Zinc sulfide is an important material. It's a semiconductor. It has a number of applications. And a lot of interest about its structure at the nanoscale. And he used this kind of simulated annealing method, heating it up, cooling it down quickly. And what he found was at the nano level, the zinc and sulfur atoms to arrange to form these lovely open structures. See the one on the bottom right hand side? I think that's got 50 zinc and sulfur atoms in, but it's still a kind of bubble like structure. And that actually came as a great surprise to us because if you look at the crystal structure, if you take a crystal of zinc sulfide. Look at how the atoms are arranged. In fact, it forms this much denser structure with each zinc surrounded by four sulfurs and sulfur surrounded by four zincs. But if you do a calculation on that, at the nanoscale, it's less stable than these lovely open bubble-like structures. So what we learn from that is that matter at the nanoscale can be very, very different structurally and regarding its properties from matter in a big bulk crystal. Uh, so let's take this even further. He started to grow his nanoparticles and he found it got even more fascinating. You got what he called double bubbles. So you got a little kind of spherical arrangement inside a bigger one. And here's probably the biggest one that he grew. And again, it's got this kind of onion-like structure. And subsequently, there's been experimental work uh, that has strongly supported uh, these models. So uh, I think both Saeed and I feel quite proud of that work. Let me just give you one other illustration. I've talked about the zeolites, which are what we call microporous materials. They've got pores of the size, size of reasonable size molecules, the molecules we have in, uh, in petrol. Now, in the early 1990s, another class of silica systems were discovered, uh, and these were, called, these were mesoporous catalysts. These have got much bigger 
uh, pores, uh, which will allow really big molecules like pharmaceutical molecules to enter into them. And uh, her work here at the Royal Institution both helped to understand the structure of these systems. Can you see? They've got this nice honeycomb structure that was known, uh, but the way in which the silicon and oxygen atoms are arranged in the walls, uh, that was predicted here by Rob Bell, who's now at UCL. And then you can implant a metal nanoparticle inside that mesoporous silica, and the structure of that and its properties were determined by Stefan Bromley, now a professor in University of Barcelona. But anyway, let's now move on to batteries. Topic dear to my heart and a very important one uh, for the Royal Institution. I'm going to talk about high energy density batteries, and let me pay tribute initially to John Goodenough. Can you see that? See him there? John this year celebrates his uh, 100th birthday, a real towering uh, scientist. John absolutely, together with others, revolutionised the field of high energy density, density batteries. I'll give more details later on. And was awarded the Nobel Prize, I think it was three years ago, uh, for his work, particularly on this lithium cobalt oxide that we'll talk about in more detail in a few minutes. Just a few words on the history of batteries. It, it's a fascinating history, and of course it links very much to the RI. The first phenomena uh, that led to the development of batteries were the observation by Galvani that when you had these two metals, iron and copper, close together, and you <laughs> put a, a muscle nearby, I think it was a frog's muscle, the frog's muscle twitched. Now, what Galvani thought was that this was an electrical phenomenon, and it was the muscle that was generating the electricity. Then later, Volta uh, said, no, that isn't what's happening. The, it's the two metals in contact that are generating the electricity. Uh, and that's the electricity that's causing the uh, muscles to twitch. And then Volta, in an absolute breakthrough piece of science, developed his pile is voltaic pile, and I think we have a, an original voltaic pile here at the Royal Institution. So an absolutely breakthrough uh, development in science and technology, and so important for the RI, because without Volta's battery, the voltaic pile, Faraday, possibly the greatest experimental genius of all time, wouldn't have been able to do many of his experiments, most of his experiments on electricity. So it shows there how scientists are dependent on the technology of the day, and Davy wouldn't have been able to carry out his electrolysis ex experiments that identified several elements. So both Davy and Faraday depended to quite a large extent on this breakthrough development by Volta. And batteries, of course, have developed <laughs> over the years, starting from the voltaic pile, the lead acid battery, and the current high energy density batteries are based on lithium. And the development of the lithium batteries is a real, again, another landmark development in science, uh, particularly in <coughs> uh, the science of electrochemistry. Now, uh, let's think about battery materials. Um, why, why are they so important? Now, the reason why high energy density batteries are so important, when we need them increasingly for transport, but of course, they are what power personal electronics. Uh, the personal electronics industry would not have been possible without the, dis the development of the lithium cobalt oxide battery by John Goodenough. And if I ever lecture to teenagers about chemistry, I take out my mobile and I say, what has it got in it? And we eventually get to the fact that it's got a battery in it. And I say that battery depends on uh, developments in solid-state electrochemistry made by John Goodenough 40 years ago at the University of Oxford. And without that, you wouldn't have your mobile. And uh, since teenagers cannot conceive of life without <laughs> mobiles, it really brings it home to them. But uh, let's just think more about battery uh, materials. Um, as I said, battery containing lithium, power laptops, the lithium ions need to move very rapidly through uh, the materials and computer modelling tells us how they move. Now let's just look before we go on at the lithium cobalt oxide battery, this real breakthrough uh, piece of solid state science and technology. Um, 
What it consists of, it's really quite simple. You can see uh, on the right-hand side there, you've got lithium. In, in fact, it's in, kind of present in, in, uh, in graphite. Uh, and when the, graphite, when the battery discharges, uh, the lithium kind of loses one of its electrons. The electrons go around the circuit. The lithium iron that's lost its electron migrates through the electrolyte and then nestles between uh, the cobalt oxide layers. A really neat piece of solid state electrochemistry, I said, developed by Goodenough in Oxford. I was a young research fellow there. I wasn't involved in this work, but we knew it was going on. We all thought it was a really neat piece of work. None of us realised, including John Goodenough himself, uh, the impact that it was going to have. But there is a big drive for developing other materials, to particularly to replace that uh, cobalt oxide, um, because there are some problems with both the supply of cobalt, of cobalt uh, problems with toxicity, uh, and there can be some issues with safety, but don't worry about your mobile. So um, here are, I'm going to si highlight uh, some work here of Saiful Islam. Uh, formerly of the University of Bath, now the University of Oxford, and he's been working with others on a range of other uh, materials that could do the same job as the cobalt oxide. Um, and again, beautiful structural chemistry. Seifel has done fantastic computer modelling on these systems. He was also a Christmas lecturer here. Let's just look at one of them. That's the lithium iron phosphate system, which he has deployed his computer modelling techniques. So this, again, experimentally, was developed by Goodenough, uh, rather more recently than his original cobalt oxide, and it's a very effective material. And one of the many contributions that Seifel made was trying to understand how the lithium ions diffuse. So can you see them? This his modelling showed how they diffuse by this lovely curved path. Uh, and it's really important to know how the lithium ions diffuse and the energetics involved in those diffusion processes. But that's been sorted out uh, some years ago uh, by Seifel and his colleagues uh, for this important material. Now, I'm getting towards the end, and the first thing I want to do is to kind of present three challenges. Can we model chemical reactions? What I've shown you so far have been essentially lots of structures, uh, but I really we haven't got to the heart of chemistry, which is about how atoms react. I'm going to then say, can we actually see atoms? Bragg's produced this model by diffraction. Uh, now, the model we know is right from the diffraction. We don't actually see. Diffraction experiment doesn't allow you to see atoms. Um, you deduce by the analysis. Uh, and can we model and understand the dynamic nature, nature of matter? at the atomic level. Well, let's take the first one, and here I'm going to highlight some work uh, from my colleague Alexei Sokol, again, was a PhD student here in the David Faraday lab, now a principal research scientist at UCL. And we're just going to take a simple example, and that is um, the activation of methane. Now, methane, natural gas, very important molecule. Of course, it's used worldwide as a fuel, uh, but a lot of incentive for trying to convert methane into other molecules rather than just burning it. And for that, you need to activate it. And it was shown some years ago that you could do that by taking an oxide material, magnesium oxide, introducing a bit of lithium into it, which activates one of the oxygens on the surface. So what we're going to see now is what happens when you bring a methane molecule down onto this activated oxygen. Um, and can you see the, the one, the methane molecules above, it's got the tetrahedral, not the planar shape, uh, and that grey feature is the activated oxygen. And we're going to bring the methane molecule down and watch how the energy goes up initially. It's coming down, energy's going up, going up. It's now reached the top of the barrier, and we're now seeing the heart of chemistry. That is, that an hydrogen atom from that methane is being transferred to the oxygen on the surface. So we've understood in detail that simple but important chemical reaction. And then the, ox the hydrogen that's been transferred stays on the surface, and a methane that's lost to hydrogen now moves away, and that's now a very active species and will react to form other molecules. So this is a simple example, but yes, we can use our modelling techniques to understand 
reactivity. Can we see atoms? This is work of a student, a UCL student, a few years ago, Scott Rogers, and he was working on a catalyst which had gold on the surface of titanium dioxide. You needn't worry about that, just think about the gold. And we used advanced, or he used advanced electron microscopy to image those gold atoms on the surface. And again, I think you will see, just have a look. Look on the top right-hand side, you will see single gold atoms. Those are those bright kind of yellow features. So when then you see a gold cluster, we have imaged, this electron microscopy has imaged atoms. We have seen atoms, which uh, this now is a widely used technique for, for, for probably well over, I can't remember, 20 years, well over 20 years, but it's got better and better and better, and we can image single atoms. Fantastic achievement. Um, I think Bragg would have liked to have seen that, and I'm sure that John Dalton would as well. And here I'm just going to show you the dynamics of matter at the atomic level. Don't really worry what's going on. This is a catalytic process, uh, methanol to olefins, taking place in one of these zeolites. What I want you to take from this is just how dynamic the system is. Can you see the zeolite framework is constantly kind of breathing and you can see the molecules moving around inside the pores. So these models can be a bit deceptive. Matter is really dynamic at the atomic level. This is beautiful work. Uh, a good friend of mine, Veronique van Spelbroek from the University of Ghent. Let me show you another one. These are methanol molecules inside the same porous catalyst. Look at that blue thing. That's an additional proton that one of them has picked up. And you'll see that you get a struggle between the molecules. One of them kind of coming along trying to pinch it. And they have a, they have a real tussle for a few minutes there. Eventually, I think the rogue one gets away with the proton. Come on, is he going to... Yeah, he's made it. He's made it, but not for long, not for long. The other one comes and gets it back. Uh, but that actually is a real example of how uh, these additional protons can move around uh, in the methanol molecules. And again, beautiful work by the Van Speybrook group. Now, I've almost finished, but I wanted to finish coming back to the Royal Institution and coming back to the foundation of the Royal Institution. Um, <clears throat> if you look at the original charter, it doesn't have what I put there, but it does have the word common purposes of mankind. Now, I've said science for the common purposes of mankind. Uh, the word science wasn't used then. I think the original is useful mechanical inventions. But the idea is the same. Uh, throughout my career, I, although I consider myself a basic scientist, I'll add parenthetically that Faraday and Davy wouldn't have understood the difference between basic and applied scientists, but although I consider myself a basic scientist, I've always hoped that my work is relevant to the common purposes of mankind. And in the remaining minutes, I'm just going to tell you very briefly about two areas that we're currently working on. The first is the CO2 challenge. Now, CO2... You know about the challenge CO2 places to climate. It's less well known that CO2 is a carbon source and we're going to need it. We're going to need CO2 to produce sustainable hydrocarbon fuels. It will become a carbon source in the future because we won't be able to use fossil fuels as a carbon source and we're going to need, incidentally, carbon capture and storage. Uh, and emerging science at applying catalytic methods to take CO2 to react it with green hydrogen to make useful fuels and molecules. So let me just show you very briefly the work of a student working with me and Dr Logsdale at the University of Cardiff, Igor Kowalek, uh, and he is working us to, on how to develop catalysts that will convert CO2 into useful molecules, in particular into methanol. Um, and by reacting with hydrogen. Now, you can do that with an existing catalyst, copper zinc oxide, but it doesn't work very well for this catalysis. Palladium, metal palladium, doesn't work terribly well on its own, but it, we think that this alloy of palladium with zinc uh, will work a lot better. And so he's been exploring that computationally. Now, I can't take you through the details of the, of the 
calculations and the chemistry, but let me just show you what he's doing. He's taking this CO2 molecule, he's looking at how it can pick up hydrogen atoms, he's looking how it might dissociate on the surface, he's identifying these key intermediates you'll see on the bottom right-hand side, and we're really getting to grips with this chemistry, and that will help us improve these catalysts, help us develop improved methods for converting CO2 into useful molecules. And my final example is from a UCL student, uh, <coughs> Jamal Nasir. Uh, Jamal is working on catalysts for removal of air pollution, particularly nitrogen oxides. And he, he, his work is examining these poor, again, zeolitic catalysts, which when you introduce copper into them, really do work. They will convert, when they react with ammonia, they will convert these polluting nitrogen gases into N2, nitrogen molecules, which, of course, is present in the atmosphere. And, again, I can't go into details, but Jamal has done a fantastic job. Don't worry about this slide. What I want to show is just a fantastic job sorting out all this chemistry, and that will allow us to improve the catalyst. The gong has gone, so I will just complete by thanking the people here on this slide who've helped me put this talk together. Let me give special thanks to the RI team for all their help uh, with the demos, with the talk, and with these beautiful models. And thank you for listening.